It was one of my more memorable birthdays. I was turning 19, and uh, I had just finished my freshman year of college, and there I was in Atlanta, Georgia, for a summer internship that I was so excited about. And that internship began with a two-week leadership intensive that had all kinds of experiences built into it. And on that particular day, we were to learn about leadership through a high ropes course. How many of you have ever done a high ropes course? A few of you. They're not my favorite thing. Can I just say that right now? Normally, I don't like to climb 30, 40, 50 feet up in the air into the trees and try and do obstacle courses. That's not normally what I think of as a fun afternoon. But here I was on my birthday climbing to the top uh, and going through this obstacle course. And you know that if you've uh, done one of these, that you are thoroughly harnessed in. You have this strong harness across your body, these cables with, that are double checked and these carabiners and the, you know all the whole thing so you you know if, if you fall if you slip you're not going to fall more than a foot you'll be dangling there for a while but you're certainly not going to plummet to the ground at least that's what your mind tells you right uh, uh, but uh, your emotions uh, and your blood pressure give you a different kind of story it can be quite uh, mentally terrifying well, I went through this obstacle course and, and actually did pretty well with it. It certainly stretched me, but, but I did it well, and I, I was feeling pretty proud of myself. And I thought, this is cool. I think, you know, this, I, I don't want to do it again, but hey, all right. You know, this was a kind of a cool experience. So I, I turned and, and looked at one of the guys in charge, and I said, hey, I, I finished. I'm ready to head down. And uh, so he said, okay, great. And he directed me over to this particular ladder but I was a little confused because that ladder didn't go down. The ladder just went up, higher, to another platform. So I, I climbed up there, and then I soon discovered that they intended for me then to get to this highest platform there and then to jump off of it. <laughs> Right. I think I was about 50 feet in the air, and I was to hook my cables to this uh, next set of, or hook, I don't know what these things are called. You can tell I don't do this. Hook the carabiners onto the cable. I was going to slide down this thing. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. I sat there on this platform. I was absolutely terrified. I'm telling you, I was staring death in the face at this moment. So I, I sat there. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you, I think for at least half an hour, <laughs> just thinking about this challenge that was before me. Now, I could physically feel the safety of the harness that was wrapped around me. I could see these cables that, are, that were secure. Uh, I, I'd already tested them throughout the obstacle course. But in that moment, let me tell you, I had doubts I had serious doubts in those moments. I started looking at the trees and thinking, I don't know, these cables are connected to some of these trees. That one looks a little dead, maybe, if I turn my head, that does, you know. And why am I going first? Am I the guinea pig here? When's the last time that they have tested this thing? I haven't seen anyone do this yet today. Am I really going to do this? But after sitting there for too long and the coaxing of my teammates, I decided it was time, and I took a deep breath, and I closed my eyes, and sweating with my heart racing and completely terrified, I threw my body off of the platform. And by my next birthday, I had finally been released from the hospital. <laughs> I'm kidding. Of course, it all worked just as it should, and there I went sailing down, falling and then sailing down uh, through, through the air. It was the ride of my life, and hopefully only the once in my lifetime that I have quite that kind of experience. But you know, when I think about that, even now as I tell the story, I can physically feel the emotion of that moment, of the fear that I was feeling. And I think about those, uh, those moments when I was sitting there on the platform and how loud the doubts were in my mind, how I was completely overcome. I could see the, all these true things right in front of me, but doubt overtook me. 
It was that moment when doubt seemed to edge out all of my faith. <laughs> and you know, it's not just moments when we find ourselves sitting on a platform doing something crazy like that, like jumping off of a, uh, the edge of a tree. But there are so many moments in our lives when doubt can be so large, when doubt can seem to edge out our faith. Today, as we talk about this subject of doubt, you know, I, I want to be honest about the fact that in, in Christianity, we often talk about doubt as something that, that we need to avoid. We might even feel that, that we should be ashamed of our doubts, that we're to be people of faith, that we're to believe, we are to trust God, and those things are true. But somewhere along the way, we maybe have picked up this message that doubt cannot be tolerated in our lives. But you know, here's the simple fact, the simple truth. The presence of faith necessitates doubt. Think about that. In a similar way, uh, courage is only necessary when fear exists. Have you ever thought about that? Courage is only necessary when fear or anxiety or something daunting is in front of us. That requires courage. Well, so it, in a similar way, so it is with faith. That, that the presence of faith necessitates doubt because we're choosing to believe something. We're choosing to affirm something as truth. We have to have faith because there is an unknown that is a part of the equation for us. Even the scripture describes it in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. You see, there is some mystery. There are things that we do not know that are a part of our faith. And that means there is the presence of doubt. Just that simple uh, reality today helps us level the playing field to say that as people of faith, doubt plays a role in our lives. In fact, we could say doubt is a perfectly ordinary experience. Today we continue in this series called Perfectly Ordinary as we're looking at the lives of some of the disciples. And today we're looking at the disciple named Thomas. Now, Thomas has a nickname. Many of the disciples have nicknames, uh, and uh, some of them are even given by Jesus as Jesus gives new names to his disciples. But for Thomas, he has a nickname that is not found in Scripture, but is strongly attached to his reputation. In fact, most of us know Thomas by a two-word name. In fact, I bet you can say it with me. He's called Doubting Thomas. There you go, Doubting Thomas. But you know that uh, that title is not in Scripture. That's developed from our Christian tradition as we've attached that to his name. And I believe we've done so with sort of a wagging of our finger and a disapproving look. Oh, that doubting Thomas as we think about him. But today, I'd like for us to take a look at him with fresh eyes because what we will find is that he is a perfectly ordinary person just like you and me. And we may find that we can relate to him in ways uh, that are really helpful to us. Now, when we study the life of Thomas in the scripture, uh, we only have a few snapshots of him, uh, moments where we can understand a little bit more about his personality and get to know him a little bit better. Thomas, of course, is listed as one of the 12 disciples, uh, but the first time that we find some dialogue is in John chapter 11. And a story is unfolding here where the beloved Lazarus has died, and the disciples and Jesus and so many in the community are broken hearted. Jesus plans to go to the family, and we know is about to do a miracle as Lazarus is raised from the dead, but uh, at this moment, when they've heard of Lazarus' death, uh, the disciples hesitate as they hear of Jesus' plan, and, and they say, you know, Jesus, just as a reminder, they tried to stone you in Judea. Are, are you really wanting to go back there? And Jesus, of course, insists that he can and that he must, and it is part of his mission. And so then we have the response from Thomas, and he says to Jesus, let us also go that we may die with him. 
What a strong and noble statement he makes. Certainly loyalty and fierce devotion to Jesus and courage, willing to put everything on the line, willing to die for Jesus' sake. But also as we read this statement, we could also say perhaps Thomas is a bit of a pessimist. (laughs) Let us go that we may die with him. One scholar says that the best description of Thomas's temperament is that he is a courageous pessimist. <laughs> it reminds me of a character that I love called Puddleglum. Anyone ever heard of Puddleglum? If you've read The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, he appears in the book called The Silver Chair. And P- Puddleglum is a very courageous guy. Uh, And he has a lot of one-liners. He's really an Eeyore sort of person. Uh, Here's a couple of my favorites from Puddle Glum. He says, the bright side of it is that if we break our necks getting down the cliff, then we're safe from being drowned in the river. (laughs) Or how about, and you must always remember, there's one good thing about being trapped underground down here. It'll save funeral expenses. (laughs) Always looking on the bright side. We could think about Thomas as a courageous pessimist uh, in the same way Puddleglum is. But as we look at Thomas today, of course, the most famous scene of all happens just after the resurrection, and it's in John chapter 20. And we'll take a look at that passage together today as we work our way through that story. Um, And uh, uh, Jesus has died on the cross. He's been placed into the tomb Mary Magdalene has gone early in the morning and discovered that Jesus is not there, and Jesus has been raised. And here we find the story continues to unfold. This is John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What a beautiful moment this is. You can only imagine how stunned the disciples were as Jesus shows up in their midst, as they recognize him, as they know him. And then this cool moment where it says Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What an incredible moment to be a disciple. And as we continue to read, though, look at verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Boy, that makes me sad for him. Thomas, one of the disciples, missed that moment. And of course, the text doesn't tell us anything about why Thomas wasn't there. We can only speculate about why that was. Perhaps, maybe, Thomas, as as one who was was, uh, prone to be a pessimist, Perhaps in this moment, Thomas was choosing isolation. Perhaps this was a moment where where all hope was gone for him. Jesus had died. He felt alone and rejected and abandoned. His hope was gone. His heart was shattered. Maybe in his devastation, he chose to withdraw and to retreat. As we continue reading in the story, it's, it's clear to us that Thomas is struggling That just like all of the disciples, this loss of Jesus has hit so hard. And doubt is looming large for Thomas. Perhaps for Thomas, that doubt that that we will see that looms so large for him. Perhaps we can think about that doubt being attached to some of these common fuels for doubt. That we too are, are prone to experience. The first is tragedy. Thomas has experienced the tragic loss of his Savior. It literally rearranged everything about his life and his heart and his world. He couldn't reconcile what happened. And you know, that's the same thing for us. 
So often in our lives, when we experience tragedy, when we have those moments when the rug is ripped out from underneath us, when we find ourselves saying, how did this happen? Those are moments when doubt is so strong. You know, volumes and volumes and volumes have been written to try and reconcile this idea of of how a good God can allow such horrors and evil and suffering to unfold here on earth. There is nothing like loss and tragedy to bring doubt to the surface. So many of us have experienced that in the most difficult moments of our lives to see that, that doubt can become so powerful that we have so many unanswered questions. I believe that may have been what was happening for Thomas. Perhaps also for Thomas was weariness and discouragement. Thomas was was hoping, was hoping against hope that, that Jesus would not have to die, even though Jesus told them what was coming. It's not what Thomas wanted. And perhaps as then it all unfolded, perhaps Thomas found himself simply weary and discouraged, tired of hoping. You know, there's another scene that unfolds between Thomas and Jesus that's very revealing. It's in John chapter 14. And we find Thomas, this one that we know is fiercely loyal to Jesus, and this conversation that's unfolding, and Jesus is telling the disciples how he's going to go and prepare a place for them. But the disciples aren't comprehending all of what Jesus has to say to them. And Thomas looks to Jesus with, a, I think, a bit of panic in his voice. And he says, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? We can almost hear the anxiety in Thomas's voice. Jesus, we want to be with you. Jesus, how do we stay with you? See, Thomas wants to be with Jesus no matter what. And so we can imagine then when Thomas loses Jesus, when Jesus dies on the cross, how completely devastating that moment would be for him. One author said this was overwhelming for Thomas. His worst fear came to pass. Jesus died and he didn't. Weary and discouraged. No wonder Thomas would have been isolated. Maybe, maybe that's something that you can relate with today. Maybe there are places in your life where you are just worn out, where you are tired of hoping, where you feel discouraged through and through. Those are the moments in our lives that can fuel doubt. Another is fear. Perhaps Thomas felt that he would be a fool for believing or that he would be disappointed. The disciples had fear. The scripture tells us, just as we read, that they were in a locked room. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders, that they would meet the same fate. They were afraid. For us, we can think about the role of fear in our doubts, that that fear uh, can play a prominent role. So often we can be afraid that if we chase our doubts, that it will destroy our faith. But that if we ask too hard of a question, that our faith will fall apart. Fear can be so very real. For whatever the reason, Thomas was not there with the disciples when Jesus appeared. And we can imagine that there was a lot going on in his soul. Let's continue in the story at verse 25. So the other disciples told Thomas, We have seen the Lord. (laughs) Now, wouldn't you think that these other disciples, his friends, the people that he had been with through thick and thin, if they're saying to him, Thomas, we saw Jesus, you would think that these would be trusted enough friends and voices that that he might believe them. But Thomas, the ever uh, belligerent in his pessimism, Uh, did not. And he responds, but Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Notice that that Thomas 
uh, doesn't tell them that they're wrong. There's, there's a bit of an openness there to Thomas. Unless I see this, then I will not believe. I think it's important to note here in Thomas's life that there's a difference between a searching heart and a hard mind, or a searching mind and a hard heart. Verse 26 continues, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. I think as we look at this moment, it's important to realize that, that Jesus didn't dismiss Peter's doubts. And he didn't dismiss Peter for doubting. But he invited Jesus to converse, or, uh, Jesus invited Thomas to conversation. He responded with kindness and he invited him to believe. Verse 28. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I love that statement. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We can pause for a moment and just breathe in the reminder that Jesus is talking about us, even right there in that statement. Because we are those who are invited to believe, even though we have never met Jesus in person while he dwelled on earth. So as we look at this story of Thomas, as we look at this famous moment of doubt, as we walk through that text together, and as we uh, maybe fight those urges that we might have to say, doubting Thomas, shame on you. Do you know what's really interesting is that when we look at the witness of the Gospels all together, I think the truth is very clear. It's an often neglected truth that's this. All of the disciples struggled with doubt. Thomas was not the only one. Sometimes we act as if Thomas was the, the only one. That's why we call him and not the others doubting Thomas. But let's take a look at this. Uh, if you turn uh, to John chapter 20, where we already are, and look at verse 13. It says that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb right after um, Jesus was laid to rest. And at verse 13, when she discovers that there's an empty tomb, she says, they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Even Mary herself in that moment was struggling to comprehend what was happening, and her go-to response was not, he has been resurrected, but that someone has moved his body. Even Mary was having trouble comprehending it until Jesus appeared to her. And he did. Jesus meets her in the garden. And then Jesus commissions Mary to go to be the first to proclaim the gospel, the good news, that Jesus is alive. So she goes to tell the apostles. But listen to what it says in Luke's account, in Luke 24, verse 11. It says, but they, the disciples, did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Now, never say that a woman's words seem like nonsense. I'm just going to say that right now. But have you ever noticed that before? That's how the disciples responded to the gospel message being proclaimed, they thought it sounded like nonsense. And right there in Luke chapter 24, it says, after this moment, Peter ran and to see for himself, he goes to see uh, the empty tomb. He sees it there. And still in verse 12, it says that he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Even Peter in that moment, after seeing the empty tomb, still had doubts in that moment. Uh, in Mark's gospel, he records the situation as well. If you turn to Mark chapter 16, uh, beginning at verse 10, his account says, She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country 
These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he was risen. And finally, even in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, right at that moment of the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. (laughs) Here we find in all of the Gospels these records of all of the disciples struggling in their faith of having these moments that were really difficult for them. And I think it says to us so loud and clear when we read this testimony of the text, that's what it is to be human, to ask questions, to try and process things, to, to doubt and to wonder. You see, so often we know that, that what's happening with those who are, who are walking this out right with Jesus among them is really a parallel thing that happens with us, that so often in the moment we can't fully grasp what's happening right in front of us. We can't fully see what God is up to. Jesus himself described that. He said to his disciples at one point, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. <laughs> later you'll be able to look back at this moment and understand what I was doing. You see, there's so much about our lives that are like that. The doubt can loom large and sometimes we can't take it all in in the moment. And so as we look at this today, I think it's important for us to to ask the question, how does our God respond when his perfectly ordinary disciples have doubts? Because we too find ourselves as perfectly ordinary disciples, as followers of Jesus. So how does God respond to us when we have doubts? Well, first, I think it's very clear with kindness, You see, this testimony of Scripture is is so clear that as people had doubts along the way, do you notice they are not disqualified? (laughs) That nowhere in these stories does Jesus say to them, all right, you're out. I'm going to draft somebody new. You're done. All of these people go on to proclaim the gospel and to be used by God in mighty ways. You see, our God responds with grace and kindness. If anything, it should be loud and clear to us. We are in good company when we find ourselves with doubts. Also, God responds to us with an invitation. We also read and heard in the text that that Jesus calls us to not be stuck in our doubts. Jesus will warn us against it and and invite us to push beyond our doubts, but not disqualify us in the process. One theologian says it this way, to choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. (laughs) That's well said. Just as Jesus said, uh, our doubts are not a place to be stuck but he invites us to believe. So today I want to ask you a question. What are your doubts today? Maybe you've had a narrative in your mind where you've just thought, I'm really, I'm used to pushing those things down. I'm used to not thinking about my doubts because I don't feel like I'm supposed to. I don't feel like I'm supposed to really give oxygen to some of the questions that I really have about God or the scripture or my faith. And today, I want to remind you that that you are safe with Jesus, that he loves you, that he responds with with kindness and with an invitation to help you, to not turn you away, but to meet you even in your doubts, just as he did with his disciples so long ago. It takes courage for us to be honest about some of our doubts But we are not alone and we are not rejected or disqualified from our God when we do so. So as you think about these areas where you may have doubts, I want to encourage you today in some practical ways to to think about what to do so that you don't find your doubts as a place where you are stuck, where, where things are immovable, but that there are ways that we can respond and not be stuck. And the first is simply to engage 
to not deny the presence of our doubt, to not be afraid by doubt, uh, but to allow it to come to the surface in our lives so that we can be honest about the real questions that we have. You know, when, uh, when I was in college and started studying the, the Bible academically as a Bible major, there were so many things that stretched my faith. So many ways that I had never understood different things about the Bible or, or, or uh, had time to dive in at that level or some of the big questions that we were asking. And at first, I, I found it uh, very jarring and like it was going to rock my whole faith. Like, uh, I'm not sure I can ask these questions and still be a Jesus follower. But do you know what I've come to find in my life is how much I value a sense of mystery in my faith. Do you know what, what I've learned to love about my faith is to know that there are questions and there are things about God that are so big that I can't fully comprehend it, that I can't fully answer it. And do you know what? That is actually a source of comfort for me now. <laughs> Because the truth is, I don't want to serve a God who is so small that I can completely understand and explain everything about him. I want to be reminded that our God is a God who has mystery, and I stand in awe of him, and he is worthy of glory and worship and praise because he is beyond what I can comprehend. And so when I have questions about my faith, there are times when, when those doubts can can become places where I can say, it's okay to not have a full answer to that question. Here's one of the quotes that I found in seminary, and I love this statement. To stand without answers in the presence of questions can be a way of truly hearing the questions. Faith is, among other things, the freedom not to know. How well said that is. That's part of our faith, is the freedom to not fully know the answer to every question. I mentioned earlier that when we experience tragedy, when we go through suffering, that that is a place where doubt can become so large in our lives. And I think that a statement like this is really helpful to us in the midst of loss and grief and times when we're questioning. Because there are moments when, when we can come before Jesus and, and simply say, I don't understand why you allowed this to happen, but I believe you hold the answer, and that will be enough to trust the one who does hold the answer. It's a courageous and it's a hard thing to do, but it gives us some grace and some breathing room to say we can trust God that we can engage with the real questions and we can trust our God with them. The second thing today is to explore. So often in scripture, we are reminded that when we lack wisdom, we should ask God. And the Bible tells us that he gives generously. And so when you think about those places where you have questions, where you have doubts, I wanna encourage you today to explore them. To, to really dive in, identify what are the real questions that you have, name the doubts that are present in your life, and talk with God about them. Did you know God already knows about your doubts? <laughs> Even when you try and push them down and not give them any oxygen, God knows about them. So have the freedom to have a conversation with God about places where you have doubt. As you do that, don't go alone. We certainly learned that from Thomas, who missed that moment, who for whatever reason was in isolation and missed that moment with Jesus. It's so much better when we're trying to work through our doubts to have a community of people to help us process, to come alongside us, to encourage us, and to remind us that we are not alone. And that's a good reminder for us to, to seek community with others and to be brave enough to say things out loud. And also it's a good reminder for us to be a good friend and to not shame others, but to be a safe and loving person, to respond with kindness and help invite someone to journey through their grief to a place of 
uh, or through their uh, doubt to a place of belief. Uh, as we explore to, to read and listen and learn, to, to pick up some books, to dive in, uh, one book that I would recommend on this subject is called No Doubt uh, by John Ortberg. It's a great read. And if this is a subject where you'd like to dive in a little better, I can't re- recommend it strongly uh, enough. And finally, uh, to experience Jesus. You know, if if our goal is to fuel belief and to not be stuck in doubt, then, then how do we do that? You know, sometimes I think that we tell ourselves that, that we just need more time. We just need some more time to figure it out. As, as if all of it's just like one of those really hard math problems. You know, I'm looking at Mr. Sipka over here, our, our resident math. You know, the ones that I'm no good at where you have a train that leaves opposite stations at a certain time and at a certain speed. And, you know, if they stop here for rest and stop there for rest and then they keep going, at what point will they cross opposite path? You know, th- those things that you think, if I just had a little bit more time, I could solve this. That, that doubt would go away. Sometimes we think that we just need a little bit more time. But you know, it's really not about just finding the right information. Remember, Jesus himself said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you remember we talked about this in the free series? That truth is not a what. Truth is not about a a secret set of information or if we just study long enough, if we just dive in long enough, we'll finally understand it all. It will finally click. But truth is a who. You will know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. When we know Jesus, when we experience Jesus, it changes everything. You see, Jesus, the person, not a set of information or or details to study, but Jesus as a person, experiencing him as a savior, this is the most powerful thing that we can do. Sometimes, when we think about our doubts, we, we think that we need just a little bit more grit or fortitude. You know, if I just had a little more willpower, I could get through this doubt in my life. Well, there was another who thought this way, a little girl named Alice. (laughs) And she learned a a lesson about belief on her trip to Wonderland. You may know uh, the story of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Lewis Carroll, who wrote the story, was uh, both an Oxford mathematician and an Anglican clergyman. What a combination. And he had a lot of interest in the nature of of belief. In the midst of the story, there's this dizzying conversation between the Red Queen and Alice. And the Queen says to her, Let's consider your age to begin with. How old are you? I'm seven and a half exactly. You needn't say exactly, the Queen remarked. I, I can believe it without that. Now, I'll give you something to believe. I'm 101, five months, and one day old. I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you? asked the queen in a pitying tone. Try again. Take a deep breath and shut your eyes. (laughs) Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. (laughs) Sometimes we operate as if our faith is like that. If we just had a little more willpower, if we just closed our eyes and took a deep breath and dried a little bit harder, we would... Be able to have the grit and fortitude to believe. (laughs) But you see, what we really need is to experience Jesus himself. And that's what he invites us to do, to experience himself, to know that he responds with grace and kindness and an invitation to us. 
that we're invited to actually get to know him, to spend time with him, to experience what it is to know him as a savior. That is where we can rest and we can find safety. John Ortberg said, Disciples are not people who never doubt. They doubt and worship. They doubt and serve. They doubt and help each other with their doubts. They doubt and practice faithfulness. They doubt and wait for their doubt one day to be turned to knowing. Disciples are perfectly ordinary people who doubt just like you and me and who experience Jesus, who invites us to know his love and to move beyond it and to know that we are safe, even in our doubts, to come to him. Will you stand and pray with me? Our gracious God, we bow our hearts before you today Lord, quite humbled as we read your word, as we consider your grace and your mercy. God, we pause and we thank you today that you are a God who responds with kindness to us. God, that you are a God who is so much more than we can comprehend. That you are the God who is worthy of praise. That you are the God who is worthy of all glory and honor. God, that you are more than we can comprehend and that you humble yourself enough to draw close to us, to dwell with us, and to remind us that we are loved and that even as we bring our doubts that we are safe in your hands and that you will love us and that you will help us and transform us. So God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room today. And God, I pray that you would give them courage courage to go to new depths with you, to be real and, and, and to bring doubts to the surface. And God, I pray for all of us that, that you would help us. Lord, we cry out just as that man did before you. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. God, would you help us? Would you help us to be people who are real and authentic, who are real about our questions? And would you also help us to be people who have big faith, people who trust you, people who are able to stand on your character that even when we don't have all the answers that we know who you are. God, we pray that our lives may be marked by your presence. God, we love you and we thank you for the way that you love us. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.